welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. And this is episode 56. And this is a program dedicated to the wonderful art of knitting. And as you've just seen, knitting can be pretty cool and funky. <laughs> that was our daughter sitting on the wall with Andrew knitting. And you guys just looked so cool. <laughs> you look like two teenagers with, with um, attitude. Yeah, well, maybe there was one teenager with attitude there. It's a while since I was a teenager with attitude. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, had, I had heaps of fun editing, <laughs> just putting them together and, and putting the music together and making it look really, really moody. Yeah, Andrea, I have to say you've outdone yourself on your selection of music, a stroke of brilliance, putting yeah. in another brick in the wall. <laughs> um, obviously, some extraordinary brick and wall construction to be seen in that um, castle ruin. That yeah. was Burg Freienstein yeah. in the Odenwald, which is just sort of south from us, where we like to go walking regularly. Yeah. Um, really spectacular scenery there. It was amazing brickwork, wasn't it? It was yeah. just really beautiful. And yeah. it was a perfect match with that music. Yeah. 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 I, what I found amazing is these sort of buttresses on the inside, you know, which yeah. really gives you the impression that these castles are built to have things thrown at them and to withstand <laughs> it. You know. Anyway, we'll move on. We are so excited about the program that we've prepared for you for this episode. Our feature interview is with the co-founders of the yarn company Mayak. And many of you may have already met Paola, perhaps at yarn festivals or even on another interview. But the other co-founder is Andrea. And Andrea is a vet and he works very closely with the nomadic yak herds people. And he goes to um, Tibet at least five times a year. He is an expert on yak and cashmere fiber and he joins Paola in the interview to talk about the animals and working with the nomads and their whole lifestyle. So it is so interesting. You're going to love it. Yep, that is a really fascinating story. We're going to Australia for Knitters of the World. We've got new releases. Andrea's giving us a quick tutorial on cabling and we're also going to give you a great little update on our cows. That's all coming up. But right now we're going to start with Bring and Brag. With you. Absolutely. So as you can see, I have finished my vest and we're all celebrating about that. Um, this the design is called Welk and it's by Martin Story. And the yarn that I've used is Lang Sund, which is Donna Smith's yarn. We interviewed Donna Smith back in episode 40 and there um, I actually got outside and got hands on with one of her fleeces um, because the yarn that she produces is from her very own sheep, her Shetland sheep. It's an absolutely stunning location there, which you get to see a little bit in that interview, so it's certainly worth having a look. Yeah, she gives you a, um, a fleece skirting lesson, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, I'm not sure that I, I sort of qualified as a, a very good <laughs> fleece skirter, but yes, I've got a little bit hands-on. I've got the boiler suit on, which was really fun too. <laughs> um, the yarn comes in three shades. This one's called... Hagri, 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 which is after the bird, the yeah, Shetland Yeah, it's named bird. after one of the birds on Shetland, so it's a beautiful grey. Um, yep. And I think it worked out really well. On the design itself, it's you can see the sort of diagonal pattern that comes in. It's di diagonals coming out here. And then at the chest level, it turns around and starts moving in again. That's really easy to actually do. It's just a three by three rib. And on every row, you move out a little bit on the bottom. And then on the up top end, you move in a little bit on each row. So that's straightforward. It gives you a bullseye on yeah, your heart. That's not the way I would look at it. But yeah. <laughs> and it's all the same on the back. So it's... Pretty easy. I think it was a good project for me. Something, yeah, did I say you did the, the seams? No, you didn't. <laughs> okay. I didn't do the seams. I have to admit that. Andrea, if you've watched the show for a while, you know that Andrea just loves a bit of good bit of backstitching, so she jumped in and did that. But I did do the picking up around here and do the rib around the collar. And so you picked up the stitches around the neckline. Yeah. Yeah. And around the, the yeah. um, sleeves and then um, continued with a two-by-two two rib on each of these. Um, the two by two rib is really neat. I think something that you got me to do was to go down. We went down three needle sizes. So the main body is done on a 3.5 millimeter, millimeter needle. The hems are sort of done on a 2.75 millimeter needle, which makes it a bit tighter. And your goal was to make it sort of sit snugly here. And I think it's worked really well. Here, this is for you, Daz. You deserve this is me. it. This is my we reward. said we were going my to be worry. drinking champagne, but I thought Andrew would prefer his Lafroig scotch. So I've been scotch. just smelling the gorgeous. I know it walked, <laughs> films. walked it across. 
the the ribbing here looks fantastic. It really it looks so neat and beautiful. Because the last thing you want when you've it's got very good ribbing when you've got a good vest is having like the vest could be really beautiful, but then the ribbing if it's too loose, it tends to just go wavy or it sticks out from the shoulders a little bit, and that just spoils the whole look. So it's it's a really good idea. You can even go down four needle sizes if you need to, but it just pulls it in, so it just falls around the natural slope of the shoulders. You look stunning. I look stunning. It's very good ribbing. A lot of <laughs> ribbing practice I've had. You look super good, so drink up and then I'll have some. <laughs> Knock it down. <laughs> Knock it bottoms up. That'll, that'll sort me out. So I'm sure you're all celebrating too because he's finally finished. Yeah. And one of the reasons why it took him so long was because he actually knitted half of one of the sizes and then I said it was way too small and yeah. he had to do it all again, which he did with as a oh. really good sport. <laughs> Yeah, what do you call that? Soldiered on there somehow. Yeah, you did. Anyway, so we've got this extra bit of knitting and we do have this leftover and I hate having leftovers. And I just thought we could turn this into a um, a vest for Jack. And it's you could be dog. Yeah, you could be matching, do matching Master matching with and the Hound. Dog. You'd look very, very <laughs> dapper, both of you. Dapper, okay. <laughs> I think what I'd have to do is um, sort of get just add on a section under here that would uh, as a binding yep. and then knit up here and around the neck and I might have to get another grey but I reckon I reckon we'd have enough and I reckon you'd both look really cool and it would actually work to have ribbing at the back because that's where his his rump is and yep. it'll pull it in. Yep. So what do you think about that as a project? Yep. Interesting. <laughs> Anyway, well done, Dal. Congratulations. Do I yes. get a drink of the whiskey? Oh, I thought you were shaking my hand. So <laughs> congratulations. You can have a sip of the whiskey, of course. Okay. But you have to be able Cheers. to talk on. So I'm going to give you a quick update of my project, which is called Harten. It's by Kim Hargraves, and it's from her latest book, Calm. It's knitted in the soft yak by Rowan. Um, in the colorway called Pampas and a few of you wrote to me after last episode when I said that I didn't know what the word Pampas meant to tell me that the Pampas are gra fertile grasslands in South America and that Pampas grass is a beautiful shade of orange so thank you for telling me that letting me know and now a lot more people know <laughs> <laughs> so that's good and it is a beautiful orange I'm I'm enamored with orange at the moment so it's a gorgeous fitted little jacket, um, kind of sits in your waist, it's tailored. I showed you last week the back piece which I'd completed and I've completed the two front pieces and I'm working on a, on a sleeve at the moment. Here's the two front pieces here. They do look rather narrow but that's just because I have to pick up stitches along both openings and, and knit the, the button bands as well. And they just sit, sits in your waist like that. What I really love at the design detail, which I did point out to you last time, is that the shaping of, of the jacket goes on in between these two major cables here. So it just gradually gets wider here and here and the stitch pat pattern in between is a seed stitch. You've also got seed stitch on the outside. Well, that's mirrored on the front here. You can see this little bit of shaping going on here which looks great and it's also mirrored in the sleeve so you can see there's two two bits here that are, are shaping out so the sleeve also does increase on the outsides but a lot of the, the um, shaping is done here in the middle and the sleeve is a three-quarter length sleeve so it's going to sit about like that here it's pretty cool mm -hmm. and it has a little pico edging on it all of them have this ribbing at the bottom, all of the pieces, here we go, have got this little ribbing which goes around and that's mirrored on the sleeve. What I really love that I don't think I've shown you before, it's just a little design detail. You start off with the, about seven stitches of garter stitch in a very fine needle to keep it delicate and then you go into the, the ribbing, two by two ribbing. But if you can see, just before you start the ribbing, she has a row of eyelets. So you get these tiny little holes right at the base and that just gives it another delicate kind of um, ornamental interest. Yep. And I'm an ornamental girl. Ornamental, interesting girl, yes. <laughs> I, I like things to be busy. 
Okay, so what I, oh, what I wanted to say is I am totally enjoying knitting this in pieces. It's a knitted bottom up in pieces construction, which is not a popular construction nowadays, but I love it. I love not having to carry the whole garment with me. So I can just carry a piece like this. It's just like a sock really. And another piece like that and, and sort of have them done. And I also love the edges. I love the beautiful straight edges on the design. That gives me a, a, a pleasure, a simple pleasure to look at. If you can see and just see. They're beautiful edges, dolls. They are. I have to say. They are really like pattern pieces cut out of material. And yep. I really enjoy seeing these straight edges, which I'll enjoy sewing up afterwards. Yeah, I was going to say you, you're looking forward to seaming them up. I will be. I'll be using my trusty back stitch. Yeah. Um, and even the shoulders, if I show you the shoulders, they're, they're cast off in, in steps. Uh, I know people don't like that sometimes. I find it, I love it actually. I love that combined with backstitch gives a really beautiful, um, shoulder seam, in my opinion, and <laughs> my experience. People get put off by backstitch because they think it's going to create a really bulky seam, but you don't, that, it's how you do it, how, how you do the backstitch. I actually find that it's no bulkier than a mattress stitch seam. So, and it's easier to do steps in backstitch than it is in, in um, mattress stitch. So, but each to their own method. And I think the final thing I wanted to say is that, um, it is a very busy design, full of cables, but it's very easy. I've been, I always knit my cables without a cable needle, and I've been doing so for the last five years or so, since I first learned how to do it. And there are a few different methods of, of knitting cables without cable needles. A very uh, common method is to rearrange the stitches, all of the stitches on your left hand needle, the way they're going to sit in the cable before knitting them. Uh, the method I use and learned was to knit half of the stitches first before you rearrange and for me I find that faster. Again, it's really, it doesn't matter, it's totally up to, to you to find a method that really fits with your way of knitting. But just in case you don't know the method that I use, I've made a little tutorial on it to show you. So hopefully you'll find it helpful. <laughs> To show you how I cable without using a cable needle. This is a trick that totally changed how fast and efficiently I can knit cables. There's nothing wrong with knitting slowly, but if you're finding a technique too slow and cumbersome, you may shy away from patterns that use it, and that would be a shame. Once you get the hang of this method, knitting cables will barely interrupt your flow and you'll be happily knitting complex cable patterns. It's good to practice this method on simple cables first and once you're confident, you can use this method on practically any type of cable. In my knitting here, I've got both right leaning cables and left leaning cables. So here is a three by three cable which leans to the right and here is a three by three cable which leans to the left. So I'm going to show you first how to make the cable with a cable needle so that you can see exactly how the stitches are being arranged and then I'll show you how to do it without a cable needle. So for a right leaning cable, when you're using a cable needle, you'd slip the first three stitches onto the cable needle and hold it at the back of the work like this. You'd then knit the following three stitches and then you slip the stitches on the cable needle to the end of the cable needle and you knit them. And there is your right leaning cable. So now I'm going to show you how to do it without a cable needle. When you use the cable needle, you took the first three stitches and you held them to the back. So you slipped them, you didn't work them, you just held them to the back. Without a cable needle, you move your yarn to the front of the work, so underneath the right hand needle to the front, and then you're kind of using your right hand needle like the cable needle, you're just going to slip those three stitches unworked onto the right hand needle. And then we bring our yarn across those stitches around under, under the needle to the back again, like that. And I'm going to pull it quite tightly because this is going to help the cables pop. And then I knit the next three stitches. So the little bar of yarn coming at the front reminds you that those three stitches 
are, are going to be moving behind just like they were on the cable needle. So now what I do is I slip my left hand needle into those three slipped stitches, those first three slipped stitches like that. You can see it there. And I move all of the stitches to the end of both needles. It's just easier to whip the needle in and out again. So then I take out my right hand needle out of all of the six, the six stitches. I've got the three slipped ones on my left hand needle and the three worked ones I just slip my right hand needle back into like this. And I move it out like that. Here's my yarn, it's attached because I've already worked those three. And now I just work these three. So that's the same as using, as if it was on the, the cable needle being held at the back and then knitted. So there we go, we have the right leaning cable. So now I'll show you how to do the left leaning cable. So with a cable needle, if you want it to be left leaning, you would slip the first three stitches on the cable needle and hold them at the front like that. And then you go ahead and knit the next three stitches off the left hand needle. And then you skirt the cable needle down to the end, the stitches down to the end, and you knit those three stitches off the cable needle. And there's your left leaning cable. To do a left leaning cable without a cable needle, you put your yarn underneath the, the needle, right hand needle, to the back of the work and you keep it at the back of the work. And again, you're going to use your right hand needle like a cable needle and slip the first three stitches onto it, like that. And then you're going to work the next three stitches. And again, this time this yarn is going to be at the back. It's going to travel behind those three slip stitches and at the back and you want to bring it fairly tight. Knit that fairly tight. That's going to help the cables pop. So that's one, two, three. And now again I'm going to use my left hand needle like that cable needle. And if you remember for the left leaning cable we had the cable needle at the front. So with your left needle you're going to bring it to the front of the work and slip it through those three slipped unworked stitches. Then you move all the stitches to the tips like this and you pull the right hand needle out of all six of them. You've got the slipped stitches that were unworked on the left hand needle and then you slide the right hand needle back into the three worked stitches and then you're ready to work the three slip stitches. And there we go, there's the left leaning cable. So I'll show you how I do it roughly up to speed. The main thing to remember is where to hold the working yarn before you slip the stitches. If you're asked to hold stitches on a cable needle at the front, that's the same as slipping the stitches with the yarn held at the back, like that, before knitting the next three. So it'll look like that. If you're asked to hold the stitches on a cable needle at the back, that's the same as slipping the stitches with the yarn at the front, like that, before knitting the next three. So I hope you found this useful. Practice it first on simple cables before trying it on more difficult ones. And once you've got the hang of it, I think you'll find knitting cables a lot more pleasurable. about 40 odd years ago when uh, a knitting craze was sweeping in Germany and my friends and I would be knitting in school, in class. Um, and it was actually quite nice when, you know, we'd be sitting there, the teacher would be at the front of the room and be talking about history or geography and 
we'd be knitting underneath the desks and um, you know you'd hear the sort of soft clapping off the needles boys and girls would be doing it and uh, if the teacher got annoyed we sort of say oh please just you know please let us get to the end of the roll my family and I came to Australia in the early 80s and I pretty well gave up knitting um, around that time. No one else was really doing it and uh, you know there were no yarn stores that I, I knew about at the time. Um, and it wasn't until the early sort of 20, 2000s that uh, my sister-in-law came um, one afternoon and pulled out a skein of yarn and I just went, what's happening? Is knitting back? And uh, it was at that time then I was introduced to um, not only the little yarn stores and Ravelry, but also the wonders of uh, hand dyed yarns and skeins of yarns instead of balls of yarns. And uh, so now, I guess, um, over the last few years, my hobby has evolved quite a bit. And I've gone from being purely pretty well a product knitter to you know, having an interest in the techniques and uh, sort of putting the yarns and colours and the patterns together. There are incredibly talented people on Ravelry who write the most amazing designs and um, I kind of see that uh, I, you know, I facilitate in a way the sort of putting together of beautiful yarns with uh, really clever patterns but then my role is to reinterpret them and uh, to make them my own and add my own style. And at the same time, yarns are coming in and, you know, I just get inspired by uh, wanting to create something unique and beautiful um, every time I hold, you know, that sort of beautiful squishy yarn in my hands. So one of the knits I want to talk about is um, one of my more recent finished projects. It's a jacket called Geiger by Nora Gorn and she combines intricate cabling technique with a lot of different textures and fits. She's very, very clever about how she puts these things together. And for this jacket here, it's one of the most difficult knits I've, uh, I've ever completed. And because you have a lot of different things going on all at the same time. So there's cables that increase and decrease in size. You've got short rows to kind of make up for the bulk of the cabling. You've got different textures increasing and wedging going on so there's a lot of things happening all at the same time so I had my pattern in front of me and I was ticking off line by line to make sure that I wasn't losing track which is not how I normally knit. Um, this project or this design by Nora is called Geiger and I actually thought it had something to do with aliens um, H.R. Geiger being the artist who created um, that alien creature and that was because there's this fabulous um, spinal sort of feature going on at the back of the, the cardigan. I did my research and I found out that Geiger actually, and I should know this, uh, means fiddler. So this is a fiddler's jacket, uh, one of the sort of traditional kind of um, coats that uh, a fiddler would wear when they're doing their business in the streets. So this is Rice by Stephen West. Um, Stephen West is a creative genius and uh, I love what he does with colours and textures and the different kind of yarns he combines and apart from anything else his photo shoots are incredible. And what I liked about this particular design was that it's actually kind of in two layers. Because it's a slip stitch you've got a sort of background colour and uh, then you've got the foreground colours and they kind of interweave as you're sort of um, constructing the, the sweater. So. It's kind of like painting with yarn, which is what I really like. You've got the sort of darkness, light of colors, and then, you know, sort of highlight tones um, that you can choose to, you know, in incorporate in, in the stripes. At the same time, I was also quite sort of interested in beading, and uh, I'd gone off and bought a bunch of beads, and um, I thought this particular sweater lent itself to adding those, because you've got these little sort of, I guess, merging stripes where, you know, the sequences change, and at that point I added the beads to just sort of uh, soften the blend and also give that little bit of sparkle. And uh, what I particularly like also was the little, you know, the, the sort of clear, like, star-like beads that are happening on the, uh, on the neckline and, um, and on the cuffs. So this is a two-for-one. I'm wearing and we have here designs by Yonka Okomoto and I really love her designs because they have an up to the minute easy fit casual kind of oversized um, appearance. 
I'm currently wearing Igawa and uh, I've chosen three yarns or colors by Madeleine Tosh and what I love about them is that you've got that sort of you know the speckling, the fade, going into purple, the earthy tones but what I really love is this one here. Uh, Little Garden uh, is the name of the design and I've used a uh, BFL wool by Eden Cottage Yarns, which was pink. And uh, just to soften it a little, I added mohair. I love mohair for the sort of soft, fuzzy feel, the cozy feel that it gives, but it also just takes the edge of the pink a little bit. And I think it worked really well with the fringing detail. So we've got sort of lacy cables and beautiful details and this kind of casual um, finish to the vest. But the whole thing really, to me, comes together through the fringing. I absolutely love to wear it for casual Friday at work. You know, you've got this sort of kind of semi-Western look. Very, very versatile thing that goes with anything in my wardrobe. This design is Drawing Straws by Willa Lee. And she is an incredible designer. She's very, very clever. And her designs and her patterns are incredibly intricate and um, very... I don't know, creative, mathematical, she's just, I don't know what goes on in her, on in her brain, but uh, she's incredibly talented. And what I love about this is you've got the um, smaller striping up here and then it goes into slightly larger striping, so that's kind of bust enhancing without being too much. And then these sort of broader stripes, I think are really quite slimming. And this whole sort of section up the top feeds into these really clever sort of basket weave textures on the sleeves. Um, you know, as usual with my sort of projects, I've added a little bit of length in the back um, and sort of made it really quite fitted instead of the usual sort of oversized um, projects that I made. I absolutely adore this. Um, I don't think um, this whole design gets enough credit for just how clever and how uh, flattering it is. Thank you, Britta, for your contribution there. As she said, Britta is from Germany, but she's living in Brisbane in Australia. When Madeline went to Australia last year, she was there for about six months, taking a bit of a break and a travel through her home country. She, Madeline, went up to what's called the Gold Coast, which is a city, and it's about 60 kilometers south of Brisbane in the same state in the north there. Very famous and very popular for its surfing conditions which there. Which is exactly what she did. That's what... <laughs> That's what Madeline did. She got right into surfing um, when she was in Australia, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I did see that um, Britta has completed the Geiger jacket. I yeah. thought that was a funny story, uh, Geiger being a German word. Um, that's I've a got design. my eye on that one. Yeah, you've yeah. been looking at that for a while. I've been trying to find the right kind of yarn because I would really love to use a Brooklyn tweed, but here in Germany, Brooklyn tweed is quite expensive. If mm. I was in America, I would definitely use it because I love their colour range too, and I really want to try out their yarn. But um, so I've been looking, trying to look for a, a good yarn substitute, and I think I've found the Dererum Natura Penelope is a good yarn substitute. So. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that design pretty soon. The other thing I really liked about uh, British Knitting is what she did with Stephen West's design with the beads, mm -hmm. putting the beads in. And she really melted her colours well together, I thought. Yep, that sounds yeah. like a really interesting design and, and interesting technique with the, the different layers yeah. there. 
Um, we wanted to give you an update on the two cows that we have running at the moment. The Vintage Shetland Cow is celebrating the launch of Susan Crawford's latest magnificent book, The Vintage Shetland Project. So in that cow, any design from the book is acceptable. There are garments, but there are also a couple of accessories and everything's fine. You can also put in your modifications. We're happy with that. Yeah. And that's going along really well. Um, if you jump onto the thread there, you can see all sorts of projects, a lot of them complete, but a lot of projects still in progress, really stunning. So that's a lot of fun. That cow finishes at the end of July. Yeah. So you've still got some time. Um, the other cow is the modif Modify Your Garment cow, which we created as a forum for people to discuss and show the modifications that they make in their projects, um, which is also really fun, just given the the really big range of body shapes and sizes and um, style also style preferences. preferences. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's heaps that you can pick up, lots of tips and tricks that you can pick up and heaps of ideas and inspiration. Um, if you just have a look, go through the comments and look at the changes that are people, people are making on their garments. Exactly. There. So what I want to do now is show you three people's work from this Carl because they've each um, got interesting projects and done really interesting modifications. So hopefully it'll serve as some inspiration for you. So the first design I want to show you is by Cindy, who is Fitter Knitter on Ravelry. So Cindy took the Boo Boo skirt by Jean DeCosta, which is a free pattern on Ravelry, and she just used this skirt design as a schematic to get all her measurements correct. So she's knitted the skirt bottom up and in the round so she doesn't need to steek. And she's designed her very own colour work motive, which is super cool. And if you look closely at the motive, you can see it's a penny farthing bicycle. And that's really cool because Cindy is actually an avid cyclist. And if you read her, her project notes, she says that she's recently ridden her age, which is 67. 67. That's impressive. It that's could, be, could even be miles, dolls. Yeah. Yeah. That's really she's, impressive. So yeah. well done, Cindy. That's, that's fantastic. So what she had to do is draw her penny farthing bicycle first and then make a chart out of it for the colour work and then, and then place it right around the skirt. She also changed the decrease rate to accommodate her own body shape because she says she's narrower in the hips and, and got a bit more of a tummy. So she's done it less tapered at the waist. So now she's got her very own personalised skirt, which is fantastic. So another completely different project is by Rika, who is Forchetta on Ravelry. And Rika took a coat design by Ursa Tricorza called Beyond the Wild Woods. So here's a picture of the original design. And you can see it's a very clever, top-down, seamless design, which lends itself to be modified pretty, pretty easily. And Rika describes herself as being broad-shouldered with a narrow back but a full bust. So what she's done to accommodate this is really interesting. The design's knitted top down, so she starts with a size 42 to accommodate her shoulder width, but then she uses the stitch counts and size measurements of a 38 for the back part because her back is narrow, and the size 40 for the front part because she's got an ample bust. So that's a really, that's a really good thing to do, isn't it? That's, mm -hmm. that's amazing. So you've got all these different sizes just so it fits her body perfectly. Rika also says that she has a sway back. So she changed the decreases in the back section. So again, if you have a look at the original design, it has decreases in an inverted V, which is a really nice design feature. But Rika has moved the decreases so it's no longer an inverted V. They're um, parallel with each other. And she's placed them to be around 10 centimeters in from the side seams. So it actually looks more like a princess line seam on sewing and that's to help her sway back. A couple of other things that she's done is she's got a long back so she's lowered the pockets and she's made the skirt of the coat less of an A-line shape and more of a, a pencil-y shape to accommodate her probably narrow hips. So you can clearly see that the design still is beyond the wild woods, but she's just done all these little changes so that it is really tailor fitted to her shape. Yep. That's cool. That's, That's really, really good. good. Yeah. And the third design I want to show you is completely different yet again, and it's by Anka, who is Anka Annie on Ravelry. 
And she's knitted uh, Lairwick by Marie Wallen, and, and Lairwick is a design from Marie Wallen's Fair Isle Club. And I have to say this, that this is only her second Fair Isle project. So her first project, she taught herself to Fair Isle on the um, Babel hat by Donna Smith. I, I did a tutorial on that. That was her first Fair Isle product, uh, project. And then she jumped straight into this design. So that should serve as inspiration to you just to j dive in. So yes. well done, Anka. So here's a picture of the original design and here's Anka's version. So first off, Anka needed to change the colors to a palette that suited her. And she didn't want the dark gray, so she took sort of like a neutral beigey cream color for the background. And then she wanted to change the motive colors. So in the original design, they're quite warm colors and she wanted her motive colors to be on the cooler side. So what she did was carefully change each color to a cooler color, but to keep the tonal shade the same as the original color. So, and tonal shade just means the same depth or strength of color. So that's how she did that. And that way she could keep the same mood of the original design. The most significant change is seen on the collar at the back of the neck. So on the original design, the front panels go into a V at the back of the neck. If you look closely, you can see that. And Anka has made hers into more of a shawl collar. So I'll try to explain how she's done that. If you look at the front of the design, you can see that it has panels running down the front. And in the pattern, they're knitted flat. But Anka has knitted those panels in the round. So if you can imagine like a long, thin cowl with a little steak at the bottom. And here's a picture of the garment after it's been blocked and she's cut the steaks. And you can see that she's knitted two of the front panels on either side of the uh, opening in the round that way. And this meant two things. First of all, she didn't have to pearl Fair Isle, which is, is a lot easier, but also it gave her this nice shawl collar with extra height at the back of the neck, which I think looks fantastic, looks really good. So that's quite a, a fantastic modification to make in the, to start off with, and bravo, Anka. And then when she finished the garment, she put it on and found that it wasn't long enough for her. So she picked up stitches all along the hem of the garment, put in yet another steak and knitted downwards to make it longer. So again, bravo. <laughs> so now it fits her very well and she must have learned a ton from doing this project. So well done, Anka. That's, so that's just an example of three different uh, projects where they've done different uh, modifications to really make the project their own and the whole cull is full of designs like that and people's work so if you haven't been there go across and read read through the comments you'll find so much inspiration if you've finished your garment already congratulations if you there's still a couple more weeks to go so if you haven't finished i hope this serves as inspiration to hurry up we haven't picked cull prizes yet but we'll get on to that and yeah. announce them in the next um in the next episode so yeah well done yep um i'm not going to talk much i've got a new project i'm not going to say too much about it right now but i will mention i'm using the fleece and harmony aran weight yarn here um, which is really beautiful. This is going to be for Madeline. Um, and it's a really stunning orangey, you like to say it's a traffic light color. Yeah. So it's really bright. It's going to be really good for Madeline. Um, very nice to knit with. We do want to mention we have got an ongoing discount for our patrons with Fleece and Harmony covers all of their yarns. And you can also, if you're a patron, you can also get a free um, color card sent out sent out to you. they've got a heap of colors so for yep. patrons you can just get one sent out for free and you can see all their colors yep yeah yep. good I'm Kay Hopkins, I'm also known as Knit for the Soul, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my lead shell design today and what inspired it. I would like to be inspired by a lot of travel and history, but quite frankly, most of my designs are inspired by the natural beauty that's found right here in the Pacific Northwest. We get a lot of rain here in Oregon where I live with my family. That means we have a lot of lush green leaves. 
I decided it was high time to put some of these leaves into my garment designs. I don't know why I hadn't done that before, but I now have a leaf collection. This leaf shell is actually the third design in that collection. The first one was a shawl that I called Eve, and I named it after her because she was, after all, the very first garment designer, and she used leaves. The second design in the collection is a shawl that I called First Bride because it ended up looking very lacy and bridal with a leaf pattern in a very falling, spirally design. So this is the third design that I'm here to talk to you about today. This is fun because you work the yoke sideways and then you work the body down in the round. I wanted to have the leaf lace in the yoke go run horizontal and I wanted a trailing vine of leaves along the sides. So what you do is you cast on your right sleeve, you work the yoke all the way across until you bind off your left sleeve. Along the way, you're building in this leaf lace in the front and you're creating the leaf lace in the back of the yoke. At the same time, you are finishing the neckline and shaping it with decreases and then increases. And when you're done with the yoke, it's all finished, except for these teeny, teeny, tiny underarm seams, which are the only seams in the entire garment, and in my book, that makes it virtually seamless. So then you pick up your stitches along the long edges of the yoke, and you work those stitches in the round and down, including this leaf lace, the trailing vine along the sides, and when the body is as long as you want it, then you start working these short rows to create your longer, more flattering length in the back. And it gives you a nice angled hemline. So my model here is wearing my leaf shell in Shibui twig. That is an absolutely fantastic yarn to work with. It's shown here in color mineral. It has good stitch definition and it has nice drape. I'm wearing my leaf shell in Knit Picks Lindy Chain and that's also a very nice linen blend. This one is linen with a little bit more silk. This is mostly linen. The different ways that you can wear my leaf shell, if you wear it alone, you have kind of a casual look in warmer weather. You can also use it as an elegant layer under a jacket or a sweater. And any fingering weight yarn or light sport weight yarn that has good stitch definition and decent drape will look great in this pattern. I hope you like my leaf shell and thank you for inviting me here. Thank you Kay for showing us your lovely summery top. I really like the side to side construction on the yoke. I thought yeah. that was cool and also the lace down the side. Yeah. I do also find that when a designer tells us about their creation, it really brings the design to life. Yeah. So that's cool. It's fun hearing the designer talk. Yep. Yeah. We often get asked by viewers who live in warmer climates to recommend um, designs that they can wear. And I think the tip here, which we can see, is to look for a designer who lives in a warmer climate because most designers design with themselves in mind. So that should be a winning strategy. I think Kay Hopkins has a lot of light jumpers and tops that are really suitable for a warmer climate. Yeah, she does. And Kay is offering Fruity Knitting Patrons a 25% discount off all her patterns. So Kay designs wraps and shawls and sweaters and tops and scarves and cowls. So she designs all the things. But like Andrew just said, she does have a really nice selection of summery tops. So thank you very much, Kay. Asking our viewers to financially support us by becoming a patron is never easy. Yeah, I think it's um, really difficult to find a balance between explaining how much work goes into producing the show and um, and still not sound like we're complaining. Yeah. Um, but it is a lot of work. And something that I've seen happening with you is when you're working with somebody to prepare the segment that they're in, um, it's quite common that they'll say to you, I never imagined how much work goes into it. And yeah. I think that's really common. Yeah. You know? I mean, we totally love producing this show and it's an absolute honour for us to meet and work with the wonderful guests that we're able to have on the show. But it is... A totally full-time job. I, I work full-time, I work in the evenings, I work on the weekends and it takes all that work to organize the kind of content that we have every two weeks. 
So just like a yarn producer or a designer needs to get paid for their work, our content is our product. We're not doing the podcast on the side supporting something else that we're doing. It's um, the, the actual content is a product. And at the moment, uh, only around 5% of our subscribers actually become patrons. And some people can't afford it, and we totally understand that, but many people can afford it. And for just the cost of two coffees per month, you not only support the show, but you also get access to some really great rewards that we're able to offer you. So if you are watching regularly and you would actually miss the show if it wasn't here, then please support it by becoming a patron. Yep. And thank you to all of the patrons who have been generously supporting the show and making it available for everyone to watch right now. So coming up now is our interview with Paola and Andrea from Mayak. Mayak is a relatively new company and I was seriously impressed when I was interviewing them at the care that goes into the creation of their yarns. From Andrea who, like I said, is a vet and he's working very closely with the nomads using traditional medicine still, which is very interesting. And also even the way that they uh, produce the, 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 or the spin the yarns in Italy, they're spinning them in a mill that's been in an area of Italy that has been spinning yarns and working on textiles for over 300 years. So there's just a lot of inherited knowledge yeah. in that area. And it's all because of the water there is very sweet and, and beautiful for, for working with high quality yarns. Mm-hmm. And as well that the fact that they're working directly with the, the nomads and paying the nomads directly. So that's yeah, to ensure that they get a, a reasonable sum of money for their yeah. fibre. So that's yep. a really exciting story behind it. So you can find uh, Mayak yarns in local yarn stores all around the world, but they also sell their yarns online in their online shop. And Mayak are offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount on everything on their website as well as in their showroom. So they have showrooms both in New York and Candia Canaves in Italy. Is that right? I think that's good. Okay. So again, the details of the discounts are on our Patreon page, but that's really wonderful. Their yarns are to die for. So thank you so much, Mayak. Our next episode is going to be delayed by one week. We've decided to put in an extra week because we have some work that we really need to catch up on. So it's going to be three weeks up to the next episode. Thank you very much for being with us today. We think it's been a fun show. We hope you've enjoyed it and we'll see you in three weeks' time. Enjoy the interview. Yep. Bye. Bye. Fruity Knitting. I have two guests with me today. Andrea Dominici and Paola Vanzo are the co-founders of the yarn company Mayak. Mayak is a small yarn company with an amazing story. Andrea and Paola work together with the nomadic yak herders on the Tibetan plateau and with small Italian artisan spinning mills. So they're buying the finest yak and cashmere fibers directly from the Tibetan herders themselves. And then they have this fiber expertly spun into yarn by specialist spinning mills in Italy. So it's quite a fascinating story to hear. First, how they both met working with the Tibetan herders and then how their yarn company has grown. So welcome Andrea and Paola. It's really fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you, it's our pleasure. 
great. So I'd like to get a little bit of background information from both of you, but we'll start with you, Paola, first. You've had a very interesting and varied career, but we'll start with your time working in Tibet. So just as an introduction, can you tell us how you came in contact with the nomadic uh, culture on the Tibetan plateau, which was also your first contact with yaks? Right. Well, I moved to Tibet uh, in uh, uh, late 99 uh, to work for an organization that focused on uh, uh, the preservation and continuity of Tibetan culture. So I had my first chance to uh, meet and work with uh, a lot of Tibetan, both farmers and, uh, and nomads. And I spent the beginning of my time there in really remote areas, up in the mountains, in uh, small villages, building schools, uh, working on rural development projects, income generation for women, a lot of education, uh, uh, teaching, uh, uh, training for uh, teachers and Tibetan medicine doctor. So it was really a uh, deep insight that I had to Tibetan culture and Tibetan traditions and it was already then that I started creating a strong bond with uh, Tibetan communities that I was working on and I was really uh, fascinated already by the uh, the cultural experience that I was going through, the spirituality, but especially by the uh, interesting uh, uh, aspect of the daily life that the uh, Tibetan, both the farmers and the nomads, uh, had. While I was working uh, on uh, this project, the organization is a U.S. Uh, organization that I was working with, uh, um, had started a Tibetan yak cheese project on the grassland, on the Tibetan, uh, on the Tibetan plateau. Uh, the project was an income generation for a Tibetan school, and the school was doing great, was doing very well, the cheese was not. Um, and uh, the cheese was not going very well, and at one point they called me saying, can you take the project on, can you, uh, you know, you're Italian, you must know about cheese, do something with it. And I was like, gosh, you know, I, even lactose intolerant, you know, I don't really know much about uh, uh, dairy, for sure, i never seen even how you process cheese, but the idea of the possibility of going and work with the nomads uh, was really uh, uh, interesting. So off I went and I started spending my uh, summers uh, on the on the grassland. I was lucky enough to be able to involve the Slow Food Foundation for Biodiversity in Italy, and I I start working with some Italian cheesemakers, and that's really where you know from this piece of cheese that's where the story really started with my involvement with the nomads. Uh, I arrived on the grassland and I start spending every summer since then. Uh, on, the, uh, on the grassland, sometimes living in one of the houses or living in a tent. We had a small cheese factory that we worked uh, with. And, uh, um, you know, and the cheese project went on and to cut a long story short, it was very successful and, uh, um, you know, that's how it evolved uh, Andrea later on as well. What changed for me was the relationship that I had with, uh, with the nomads. Uh, uh, you know, they have a very tough life. Uh, but at the same time, they are strong, passionate, fierce uh, people. Uh, they have much more in common with uh, uh, my own culture, the Italian culture, and uh, uh, than I ever thought. You know, the, the bond they have with their children, the family, the values, and the ethical aspect of their daily life. And they have a very rich tradition, you know, with their bond with the animals and the land. How the important, how important it is for them, the you know, the grassland that they live on, and how important the animals are. So spending time with them made me appreciate, uh, you know, life much more. I felt more at home there than definitely that I was in New York or even back home in uh, uh, in Italy. And, uh, and I knew that I just, that's who I wanted to work with and help. I didn't want to be like a charity or anything like that. I really wanted to be a partner in a new journey and help them in a different way uh, as, uh, as I could. So Andrea, let's hear a little bit about you. You're also Italian and um, you're a vet. So you've been working very closely with the herdsmen. So tell us a little bit about your work and then why it became important for you to help the nomadic culture or, or help them to, to stay on, the, on their grasslands with their yaks. Well, I, I met Paula at 4,000 meters. I saw her the first time on the grasslands. 
because uh, in, uh, in this uh, cheese, uh, cheese, uh, cheese project, so she was a project manager, uh, an Italian cheesemaker was uh, already there, but the problem was the quality and the earth of, of the milk and the earth of the yak. So it was the right moment that uh, a vet could come on the project. And uh, we spent uh, a few summers together in order to stay time with the Nomad family, to teach them how they can milk the yak, keeping their tradition, but producing a product with uh, acceptable uh, hygiene rules. And uh, so for me, it was a, a great surprise. And uh, what impressed me the first time, it was really how they don't just raise the yak, because they, it's like a symbiotic relation between the, the nomads and the yak. They live together, and uh, the yak give to the family everything they need, the milk, the meat, the, they are transport animal when they move from, from from winter grassland to the summer pasture. They use the yaks like uh, transport animals, uh, and uh, and also the hair of the of the yak. They are used for the tent for the dressing. So is something that uh, there is really a street connection. Every morning when they wake up, uh, they make their offer to the to the divinity, and uh, they look uh, look after their animals. One thing that uh, stupefied me a lot is that uh, in, a, in a lot of uh, tradition, when the people have to make a sacrifice something to the divinity, they kill an animal. And uh, the, the Tibetan did exactly the opposite. They choose it, a young yak, they put a red sign on the here of the yak, and this animal was totally free for all his life. He could change herd and was uh, welcome from all, also the other family. So, I think that uh, this uh, act uh, is uh, is simple, but uh, is really it really reflects uh, how how strict is uh, their connection with uh, their environment and with uh, and with their animals. So this uh, was the start of our adventure mm -hmm. together on the plateau, and walking in the tent, uh, we we spent a lot of time interviewing families. Uh, and we had the occasion, because I was consulting a lot of uh, animals uh, with the local veterinarians, trying to use the traditional medicine that is uh, incredibly useful. Uh, and uh, I was touching this little animal, this little yak, and we really was both uh, stupefied by, uh, by how soft was uh, this hair. But for a few years, this uh, stayed like just a sensation. After we remembered about that, uh, and we and together we had the idea to develop something about uh, about uh, the yak fiber. I think at that point uh, it was, if I may say, is uh, uh, it was getting a little bit more difficult for the nomads to remain on the grassland. Uh, there was a lot of uh, um, new government policies that. Uh, uh, indicated that uh, uh, the nomads had to resettle to a more urban setting and they had to, you know, they would lose their animals and they would lose their, uh, the grassland as well. Uh, so we were really trying to find a way to ensure that the, uh, the nomadic community and uh, families that we were working with could identify another way to support their lifestyle, uh, to support their traditions by remaining on the grassland. And by being uh, sustainably, economically sustainably, sustainable, uh, we thought that we could give them a better chance as well. So we, dis we had a lot of discussion with the families that we, you know, we became part of a bigger family uh, as well. We kept going back to the same people. And that's how uh, we knew that the milk and the cheese that we were producing was not enough to make that kind of a cash flow that they needed, uh, not just to send their children to school or to pay for medicines or uh, to just go on with about their daily life, but to be able to support their lifestyle. And, uh, and that's how, you know, after we look at the fiber, we realized that the fiber was something very precious and uh, nobody else was really looking at this at the time, we thought, sure, why don't we try, you know, we tried so many other things, but we wanted to do it you know, on our own, and uh, we come up with the idea of uh, uh, starting uh, my yak. Okay, so there is already a market for yak fiber, so why isn't the industry already supporting the nomadic lifestyle? Well, it's, uh, uh, 
you know, there is definitely a lot of uh, yak fiber on the market. There was then and there was now. As Andrea was saying, uh, yak fiber is uh, used by the nomads themselves for their, uh, to weave their tents and some of the clothing. Even if now with uh, uh, more, you know, modern times coming in, even the nomads prefer to buy the more uh, mm, synthetic uh, bright colors uh, uh, that you can find uh, on the market. And this is one of the reasons why uh, you know, you can always see the nomads, they are beautifully dressed in their dark chuba, the traditional dress, and they have a pink scarf or a yellow uh, belt or uh, with of these bright colors. So they were like, you know, definitely there was this yak fiber, and uh, but the quality was, uh, uh, was not the same. The quality that you find on the market, and I'm sure Andrea will explain more about the quality of the fiber. But what we were trying to do was trying to uh, generate an income that would go directly to the nomads. Uh, right, you know, at the time, and even right now, most of the fiber is sold to middlemen. Uh, they then sell it to the, uh, you know, to other uh, luxury uh, fashion brands. And right now, uh, you know, yak has become sort of the eat fiber. It's the new uh, hot fiber to have. And a lot of the uh, big fashion brands are actually producing uh, their collection, including the yak fiber. But they don't buy from the nomads. So what the nomads themselves get is peanuts. It's really nothing. And we want you to put the nomad at the center of our venture. We wanted to make sure that uh, they would gain uh, from uh, uh, our idea, and uh, uh, and we knew that we were in to uh, to find a way to help them better. Uh, and we formed them in a cooperative, which was the first cooperative in uh, uh, in mainland China, actually, uh, and we started working with them. So we just pay them pay directly. Uh, we you know we buy the fiber and we pay directly. Don't we cut out the middleman. And, uh, uh, and this way, it's, uh, uh, it's a completely different chain. You know, it's a much more ethical and sustainable and uh, short chain. So the people that buy the yak fiber from us, the baby yak, also know where the fiber is coming from, which you cannot say uh, the same for any of the other yak fiber on the market. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. So just another quick little question, and this is probably for you, Andrea. How does the herding practices of um, yak and Kashmir goats affect or impact the Tibetan grasslands environment? Well, uh, traditionally, the nomads, uh, they are really nomads, so they move around the grasslands, uh, and their traditional uh, way of living is totally in harmony with the environment. When the industry arrives, it can change this, uh, this balance uh, and also the, the environment can be affected. It's important to know that uh, the yak is a not selective grazer, so he, he grazes all the grass at the same time. So, uh, and it's very different to the Kashmir goat that are a selective grazer, so they just pick up what they like. The problem is that the goats picking up just some species of, uh, of plants they change the composition of the grassland. And uh, in uh, a lot of here can be changed, it can, uh, can reach uh, the desertification, that what was happened in, uh, in Inner Mongolia, just uh, to give an example, where, the, where the, the, the Kashmir goat rising is very industrial, and where there was a grassland, now there is just a desert. So traditionally, the nomads, uh, they raise uh, the Kashmir goat just in the rocky area, almost never in the grassland, because the grassland is not a place for the goat. And the yaks, what is important is to calculate, but they know how to do traditionally, the density, how many animals per hectare of land, and to move then to change pasture very often in order to, that the grass can grow again and the, and the grassland the stay can be preserved for a long time. So this is a very important aspect and we take care a lot about that because it's a very delicate ecosystem. It's the, also, if it doesn't look like a forest, when the grassland is destroyed and the land is not anymore covered by the grass, it can be desert very, very fast. Okay, that's, that's really interesting and quite scary. So you're producing cashmere fibre or you're buying cashmere fibre. So I assume you're taking this cashmere fibre from goats who are more on the rocky areas. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. There are different families 
family on the grassland that just raise yaks and other family that, that in general are mass, uh, much poor because they live in uh, in area not so beautiful with rocks uh, with not good grassland they just raise goat so they are part of the same cooperative but they live in other villages where is a more, more rocky area and not uh, not grassland so Andrea, we'll stay with you for a minute because you're the expert on, on yak fibers and things. Yaks, um, they produce several different kinds of fibers. So can you just tell us how have the fibers been collected, sorted and used traditionally by the herdsmen? And in comparison, how are you collecting and sorting the fibers so that you've got really high quality um, yak yarn? Yes, well, there is uh, several, as you were mentioning, a, a different type of yak fiber. The more popular is the, the coarse hair, the raw fiber that is used to make the traditional, uh, the traditional tent where the nomads uh, usually live. Also, it's unfortunately, now they can buy some uh, plastic tent, uh, but we really to push, we push them to continue with their traditional black tent. And it's also interesting to know that the hair of the tail of the yak, they are very long and very strong, so they are used to make ropes and with an incredible, uh, they are very, very resistant. After, there is the down. The down is the undercoat that uh, grow up in the autumn and spontaneously fall down each spring. So when they collect uh, the undercoat, uh, there is uh, no more connection between the fiber and the skin, and for this reason, it can be considered a vegan fiber. So we choose it uh, to work clearly with the undercoat, but just with the undercoat of the young yaks after the first winter of year of, uh, of life, because the fiber is much is warmer and is uh, softer than the adult yak. So, uh, and what we did, we trained the nomads how to pick up just one category of animal and at the same time to share the, the different uh, colors. So to divide the, the, the chocolate yak, the gray, the light gray, in order to have a few natural color and not to bleach the fiber that is something that really, is really, really bad against the, destroy the fiber and destroy the environment uh, as well. So uh, in this way, they can have work on their fiber and have a product with a higher value and a better income for the family as well. Okay, that's so interesting. So you go there or you went there and you worked with them to do it and now you just go back every year, do you, to, to gather the fibers or do you, get some, do you get it sent to Italy or...? I go to Tibet in general at least five times per year because with the same community we are building a dairy processing factory so to make the yogurt. So for both activity, for my yak and from the dairy, for, for the dairy project, I spend a lot of time. I was with them in the end of February when it was really, really cold. I will be back in May because they have to feel that we work together. They, they don't have to have the perception we are just some foreigners that come to buy the fiber. This is not good. So they have to feel part of the Mayak supply chain. It's, a, it's, a, it's an important aspect. So I spend time with them. I show the picture. I bring to them some final product so they really can understand what, uh, what we do with uh, their product. That must be so exciting. Yeah. So let's talk about how, because you take the yak and the cashmere fibers and they're spun in Italy. So why Italy? Now, obviously you're both Italian, but did you have any prerequisites for choosing the kind of spinning wheel mills that you're working with? We, are, uh, we live in Italy, not far from Biella. Biella is a city situated in the northwest of Italy, where there is the luxury textile district. And this uh, district was born uh, 300 years ago because the water of the spring of this part of Italy is uh, very, very sweet and suitable to wash the wool. So this was the reason why Ermenegildo Zegna and Loro Piana started their business in this area. So in the, since uh, 
several centuries, uh, it has been developed a very deep knowledge about how to spin and how to split the, also the noble fiber like uh, cashmere and, uh, and yak. So we have two uh, important aspects uh, that we took care when we choose at our network of little uh, supplier of, uh, of little, uh, the network of the of the meal that process our fiber is the first the quality so we need a very to have a top quality and the second but is not less important is the impact on the environment so we we check that the wastewater where we dye the fiber are totally treated and clean so that our supply chain has a zero impact on the environment. So we really believe that it is important that our supply chain is sustainable from the social point of view and also from the environment from point of view. Wow, that's that's cool. That's <laughs> that's really great. So let's just talk now about um, the knitting world, because Paula, your first major foray into the knitting world was at uh, Vogue Knitting Live 2013. Yeah. So just based on that experience and the feedback that you got from that event, did you have to change any of your initial ideas or your plans for your yarns? Or yeah, tell us a little bit about how that went. It was kind of a surprising for us. We were so geared up, we were so excited about having our yarn, our baby yak, and uh, we had these uh, beautiful skeins of uh, uh, the natural color, which is this dark chocolate. And I love brown, so I was very excited. And we had dyed, uh, we over dyed the chocolate in a second color in the burgundy. So um, when I arrived with my uh, suitcases and uh, uh, to the uh, you know Times Square is where the book knitting is held, I went in towards trying to find my booth, and I was so flabbergasted because I saw so much colors and yarns with nothing I've seen before, speckles. Uh, uh, <laughs> colors like bright neon and uh, and I just had this basically this huge bag of chocolate brown and a chocolate booth and I thought what am I doing here I'm just going to crash uh, this is a disaster <laughs> I'm like nobody will ever even look at us and uh, uh, but instead I think it was already then something new something different and people were coming to us saying, whoa, that's a moment of peace. This is calming. This is crazy. It's overwhelming. And here, you know, I was just very calm. We were talking and, uh, and we sold a lot, which was, you know, we got really excited. I was like, oh, wow, we, you know, we, did, we actually physically sold some, uh, uh, some yarn. But I thought within, you know, myself, this is something that uh, we want to stay true to. Our story, our, uh, you know, our ethical principles, what Andrea was talking about, the importance for us not to pollute the environment, to work with natural, more natural colors and uh, uh, not to go crazy with different things. We wanted something that lasted a life, uh, lifetime. For a very brief moment, we thought that we had to change and do something else, but then we say, no, let's stay true to our path. Let's believe in what we believe. We work hard to get here. And if we keep pushing, we will get to the top of this. It took us a while because a lot of the stores didn't want the, uh, didn't want the yarn because it was only two or three colors. We slowly added some of the colors. I think that at the end, our decision not to bleach the fiber, as Andrea was saying, was a winning uh, decision. Uh, we, were we managed to source more of the lighter colors and only dye on the top of the light colors. And now everybody says that our palette is, everything goes well together. There's not one color that doesn't go with the other. I think you're right. I mean, a, but apart from the fantastic story behind your yarn, there is definitely a market there for natural shades. Yeah. And you probably would have got a good feeling for that at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival more yes. recently. Yes. That there's a lot of people who are very much interested in as unprocessed as possible yeah. yarns. I think yeah, that, so if I may say, the Edinburgh uh, Yarn Festival that we were lucky to, to, to participate, it was a fresh breath, oh, fresh of, uh, uh, a breath of fresh air, sorry for that. Um, I think just seeing that there were so uh, many other brands that we admire and they had those natural colors and simple colors and uh, it was not crazy, uh, you know, hand painted or, uh, or really bright colors. I think for us was uh, um, uh, 
you know, was allowed us to say, yes, we are on the right path, let's keep going, because this is what we believe in, what we want, and people are responding to it, which is great. Yeah. Okay, so my next question is something that all knitters are going to want to know, and that is how does yak fibre behave when it's knitted up? And is it, uh, is it more versatile, perhaps, when combined with other fibres? What I'm getting at is if you compare alpaca, for instance, with wool, alpaca is very, very warm and it's very, very soft, but it doesn't have memory, so it does stretch more than wool under its own weight. Or um, cashmere can um, is wonderfully soft and, and warm, but it can be, um, it can tend to peel sometimes. So what do you have to say about yak fibre? How does that behave? Yes, concerning the, the thermical property, yak lives in very high altitude. If you go to Tibet, you can find the goat just to 3,000 meters, 3,500, but if you go at 5,000, 5,500, you can find only yak. So uh, yak is warmer 30% more than merino's wool and a little bit more warmer than cashmere. Con concerning the warmness, is a really warm uh, uh, fiber. Concerning the softness, our baby yak is uh, around 17, 17.5 microns, so it's really close to cashmere. So the sensation that you have is very, very close to, to cashmere. Concerning the memory, is a, is a yarn that has a good memory, very close to the wool, so it can combine the softness with a good memory. This is a, a very important property, in my, in my opinion, of, uh, of, uh, of, yak, uh, of yak fiber. So uh, I, I really think that uh, is a, is not is not a compromise because concerning the terminal property is really is really unique, but uh, is uh, is really really great. I'm not a knitter, but uh, the impression <laughs> that I fell from the knitter was it is really yeah. good. I good think to knit. you know the the, the, the baby yak uh, has a great stitch definition. So a lot of the designers love it because of they can do crazy cables and it really they really come out beautifully. So that's, uh, uh, you know, even on the darker uh, colors, the darker shades, you can really see the uh, cables uh, beautifully. And as we say to both, uh, uh, you know, the knitters and the designer, the yarn, the baby yak is, uh, is a fiber that blooms after uh, blocking and uh, washing and blocking. The peeling, uh, our cashmere, it almost doesn't peel, but all the cashmere can not uh, to peel if uh, the dehairing, so the process, the separate, uh, the coarse hair and the down is done properly. <clears throat> it means that if when we dehair, we push the dehairing, we don't have a big hilt because it's not our objective. So the very short hair that in general are responsible of the peeling, we don't use in our yarn. And this is valid for the cashmere and for the, for the yak. So we invite the knitter to try our cashmere because it almost doesn't, uh, doesn't peel. So it's, uh, it's, not, it's a belief that all the cashmere make peeling, but it's really not, uh, not, uh, not always true. Wow, that's really fascinating. So let's see some of your yarn. I'm excited to see it. So I want to start with our uh, um, baby yak in chocolate. So this is the original color. That's the color that I brought at Vogue Knitting uh, uh, the first time. And this is one of our uh, uh, strongest uh, uh, bestseller as well. This is uh, uh, the 100% baby yak in medium weight uh, and uh, uh, in the um, natural chocolate. We actually have two more shades uh, in uh, natural shades, which is the desert and our uh, um, oatmeal. So these are the three natural shades and all of that palette is based on these three colors. Uh, as I was saying, we do not bleach, so the darker colors are on the chocolate, the medium uh, colors uh, medium shades on the desert and the lighter colors, so our saffron or emerald or lavender are uh, are dyed on the oatmeal. Interesting to know that we actually uh, pay uh, the nomads a much higher price for the oatmeal and a little bit for the um, for the desert rather than the chocolate because this is very rare. This is like the sheep, the uh, the, the black sheep. So 80% um, of the baby yaks are these dark colors and only few are of this color. So of course we want to pay more the nomads and we want to reflect that price to the uh, end consumer as well. The 100% uh, baby yak comes in two weights, a medium weight, 
uh, which is really a worsted and uh, um, laced weight, which is what I have uh, on in one of the lighter color. So the lace weight is very light, very thin, and uh, very soft uh, as well. The baby yak has the stitches uh, very well, so you can see uh, this is in the oatmeal, it's super soft and, uh, and, and, and beautiful. We are very lucky that we can work with a lot of uh, uh, great designers uh, uh, as well. They made beautiful products uh, uh, for us. And uh, uh, after the baby yak, we thought about uh, uh, trying a different uh, blend, and we worked with uh, baby yak and silk. So baby yak, 50% baby yak and 50% silk. We only have done one weight, which is a finger, a light fingering weight. Uh, which is really beautiful for uh, spring and summer, for shawls and uh, uh, light uh, uh, sweater as well. We have uh, a beautiful palette of uh, 12 colors right now, and I just wanted to show you this because it's one of my favorite uh, uh, pieces that you can see it in all of the colors uh, uh, together and how they uh, knit up. This is actually the Betty Moat Cowl by Kay Davis, uh, uh, which I admire so much. And besides the baby yak, as Andrea was saying, we have started a new production of uh, uh, Tibetan cashmere. So we have done 100% uh, Tibetan cashmere, both in the uh, medium weight and the fingering weight. And these are the, um, the skeins of the cashmere. Um, and uh, uh, what we have done with the cashmere, we have done, uh, we have created two lines. One was uh, a natural dyed cashmere and we worked with uh, uh, natural dyers both in France and uh, here in, uh, in Maine and we come up with a very soft beautiful uh, uh, palette of colors that would appeal to uh, any knitter and we have some uh, uh, you know, beautiful sample we have the Lilia hat uh, by Sarah Solomon knitted up in these colors and then we also created a line of uh, pop colors maybe to go more with uh, 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 you know, with uh, bright colors that uh, people like. It was easier for us to do it on the Tibetan cashmere, of course, because of the base, of the white base. It was not possible to do it on the, on the baby yak. And we have uh, a lot of uh, um, bright colors uh, that you can uh, see in a lot of our uh, new um, kits and uh, patterns that we have. So this is what we have. It's not, uh, you know, a huge... Uh, amount of lines or uh, of product, a very selected few colors. Each year we decide whether to continue a new color or retire it and uh, uh, and create a new one. We cannot go, or we cannot extend the number of colors that we uh, that we create, and we don't want to. And we have something for uh, every knitter, from something which is very light and simple uh, to something that is much more intricate and uh, um, color works of Fair Isle uh, as well. Well, thank you so much for showing us. It, they just look beautiful, beautiful yarns. I love the shawls that you've shown and, and the hat as well. And thanks to you, Andrea, for joining Paola. It was, it's really great to see you because some people might have just thought of Paola as the, as the company founder, but you <laughs> both are. And your expertise, your fibre expertise is really interesting to listen to. So, it was, so thanks so much for sharing that. Thank you. <laughs> No, thank, thank you, you for having it's a, us. A great and, uh, pleasure. Yes, and I'm actually very happy that I had a chance to have uh, this interview with Andrea because, as you said, he's you know, always in the background and uh, you know, he has the expertise. He's the one that uh, goes to Tibet now uh, as I, uh, you know, I stay more on this side. So it was special to have him here with me today. Well, you make a fantastic team, a very interesting team, and both of you have got very interesting life stories and, and the company story. So we're really um, proud to have you on the show, and we want to thank you again for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank you, again. you so much. Okay, so we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. 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 <laughs> Oh,